Okay, so let's uh, go ahead and get started this morning. I'm John Stasco from Georgia Tech, and this is the Natural Language++ plus plus, uh, session. I think uh, Natural Language Connections to Viz has been one of the big themes this week. We've kind of seen it from the beginning throughout. Uh, there's a lot of different applications, whether it's figuring out captions or controlling visualizations through NL and speech. Um, I, I see it very much as a growing topic. And uh, it's great you know, to, to finish with this best session of the week uh, here. They, they, you know, they, they held the best for last, like to think of it. So uh, we have three in-person and three virtual presentations. And our first presenter is Noelle R. I'm going to go with that. Uh, and she is a PhD student at WPI in Massachusetts. And the title of her paper is Probablement, Wahrscheinlich, Likely, a cross-language study of how people verbalize probabilities in icon array visualizations. Take it away, Noel. Um, thanks for the introduction. So hello, everyone. Uh, in this talk, I will tell you about our exploration of how quantitative reasoning with visualization can vary across languages. So in the paper, we show that if we gave people estimation tasks for which they normally use numbers, but then we replace the numbers with visuals, and then we repeat that across languages, we then learn that people's quantitative estimates differs across those uh, languages, and we think that this could open new perspectives on cross-language study of visualizations. So let's take a, first, uh, a step back into what led us into this research. Data visualizations today are used in different places and in different languages. There are a few studies that investigated this intersection between language and visualizations. For instance, color names, uh, it's shown that Color names across languages do influence the um, communication about data and visualization. Other research, rather slightly adjacent to visualizations, also show that preferences for time representation can sometimes follow the, the, uh, the direction of the written language. And what these studies have in common is that they surface this interesting opportunity and challenges for cross-language studies, and they also focus on categorical aspects of data visualization. But data visualization is also and essentially about quantitatively reasoning with data. So we can then ask how such quantitative reasoning could vary across many languages. We narrowed this question a little bit down in the paper and we focus on probabilistic reasoning with icon arrays and across five languages. Now to design the experiment, we needed to find tasks that would involve all the three, the probabilistic reasoning, the icon array and the languages. And for that, we turned to the interpretation of probability expressions. So the work that informs ours is Kent's study called Words of Estimative Probability. And in this kind of study, participants were given, uh, they were asked to provide numerical estimations for probability expressions like almost certainly, probably, etc. For our case, we adapt the study and we focus instead on the verbal versus new, um, visual representation of probability. And for the visual, we use icon arrays because they are good for showing proportions visually and they are used a lot in communi for communicating probabilities. So to summarize what we've seen so far, our study consists of two, uh, of two types of experiment. So participants will see both types, but in a random order. So half will, will start with expression to this, and the other half will start with this to expressions. We'll talk uh, more about them later. And we use a 10 by 10 icon array with orange and gray icons. And also we work with 18 probability expressions. The study is translated into, uh, from English into Arabic, French, German, and Mandarin. And we recruited 50 participants for each language. All the participants are required to be native speakers of um, their experiment. And then when a participant takes the experiment, we prompt them with a fictitious scenario where we tell them that there is a, they are drawing a tile from a set of 100 tiles. And some of the tiles are orange and some of them are gray. 
and that if they pick an orange tile, they will win some prize, um, and, but that their chances for that would vary depending on this orange to gray proportion. Now let's, uh, talk into, uh, let's talk about the first experiment, which we named expression to visualization. So given the scenario I described to you earlier, we, th we then tell participants, you will likely draw an orange tile. And we ask them to visually represent this proportion of orange to gray tiles that they think would help achieve such likelihood. We, we then also tell them, vous allez probablement tirer un carré orange. Stay with me, that's the French instruction. And we repeat the same in German, Arabic, and Mandarin. And each time we collect what people, um, the, the value that people assign to the different probability expressions. Now, we analyze those different values, and we observe that there are significant differences between the expressions across those languages. And we take, for instance, the case of the English word likely. So, except for the Arabic translation, we found that the other expression seems to have been assigned much lower values by the participants. Um, for those cases where we saw this, those different differences from the uh, original Eng English expressions, we tried to find translations that would align together, meaning a pair of expressions that would not significantly differ. And for that, we proceed to a postdoc test to then surface cases, for instance, here taking the case of the Mandarin uh, experiment, we found cases where one expression with, uh, in English would match or align with three different expressions, or also cases where we have had expressions that did not have any match at all. Now onto the second experiment. This one is the reverse of the first experiment. So in this one, we explore how people would choose probability expression and assign them to visualization. So people will see, participants will see different probabilities in the icon arrays, and then they are asked to select expressions from a proposed list. We analyze how people make those use of those different expressions. So we take the example of the Arabic version. So it has the highest average number of unique expressions assigned to an icon array. For instance, the um, 15 unique expressions out of the 18 original uh, from the list were assigned to the um, for 40% 40, 40 icon arrays. In contrast to the Mandarin version, it, it had the lowest average of number of unique expressions per icon arrays. So um, this could suggest that the participants in this language are rather more consistent in the way they assigned the different verbal expressions to the visual representations. Another form of consistency is also um, that some expression barely or rarely received assignment or were rarely assigned to a visual um, representation. Okay, now to conclude. We designed a study with um, two types of experiment and in five languages. So every experiment received were assigned to 50 participants and we named them expression to viz and viz to expression. Within each language, we noticed that there are variability in the interpretation of probability expressions, meaning that there is no strict one-to-one -one mapping in the way that people speaking one language would um, assign or represent a probability expression into a visual in an icon array. Also, in some languages, participants were more um, consistent in how they would talk about specific account icon arrays. So we saw the case where an, a language had more, less options for talking about the visual, whereas another language had many, much more options. When comparing across the different languages, we noticed that participants did represent the translated expressions visually, and there, that the expressiveness varied across the translations. So we came across cases where participants did report to us that it was very hard for them to find or assign a visual representation to the translations that we propose to them. So for us, this means that translation then, when we associate them to data visualization, are not as, straight, as straightforward as they would be for, say, for verbal translation. Now, our study is just one step towards this cross-language study of data visualization. 
So we found that there are differences in expressiveness of languages when they are used together with visualization. And we think that that suggests that we need careful choices of language when we work in, say, in multilingual settings. Because sometimes people, for instance, could use languages that could, does not necessarily resonate, resonate correctly with the targeted audience of the visualization. And that can impact the use of text and description with visualization and the, the way visualization are presented or designed. And also that could also impact the takeaway that people um, take away from the visualization. And finally, the rhetoric and the stories. Beyond the, this paper, we'd like to extend more uh, to more different cultural dimensions than languages, and, but we also would like to extend to different languages. So if you do speak a language outside of the five that I listed here, or if you're interested in this kind of topic, please do reach out to me. I'd like to thank everyone who helped us design this study, and we still have our poster hanging over there in the Oklahoma Station 2. We, it's also about language, where we compare how people talk about language in, uh, about visualization in their native versus in a foreign or secondary language. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Noel. We have a, a number of questions here. Let me kind of pick a few and throw them out. One is, could your study help with better translating text about probabilities from language to language? Sorry, could you repeat Sure. This? Could your study help with better translating text uh, about probabilities from language to language? Kind of people, people having difficulty doing translations could in a way your study help saying, actually this word goes more to that word. Oh, okay. That's yeah. a Thanks. Um, I understand. Uh, that's a good question. So, for our study, uh, when we did the translations, we recruited native speakers um, to do those different translations. And the hope, that the idea behind the study is that we wanted to showcase actually how people speaking those different languages would interpret the probability expression in different uh, values through the icon array without the intermediate of um, numerical values. So we sure we do hope that the study would surface those like those differences between those different expressions and those different uh, languages of how people assign probabilities to visualization when we make abstractions of the um, the numer numeric okay. numbers. Mm -hmm. and I'll, I'll do one other one quickly. Do you think your study results depend on similar language origins? like Latin-based versus logographic, Japanese, et cetera, are the, the languages kind of clustered by their, orange, by their origins? Oh, yeah, I, that's a very great question. We are very interested in that, to explore this, what is actually this impact of why people in the similar group would assign uh, probability values that are very close to each other? What makes this uh, things that the intervals were not super spread out, but they are still, there's still this consistency among the participants. That's definitely part of our future studies to go beyond those. Um, so right now we only have a very simple scenario, but we want also to explore what are other criteria or uh, characteristics that make those interpretation of language and visualization happen. Okay, very good. Well, let's thank Noelle again. Thank you very much. So our, our next paper is online, and we'll connect up. This is Jun Tao from Sun Yat-sen University. I'm glad today to share with you our, one of our recent work that's flow and I'll asking the flow data in natural languages. My talk today will follow this outline. I will start from the motivation, why we want to do this, and I will show a short demo of it and explain the technique and how we evaluate the technique and finally come to a brief discussion. We all know that uh, showing the structures and their interactions in flow are critical for flow visualization 
because they briefly conveys the most important information regarding to the flow in a concise way. However, the experts from different domains, they are often interested in different structures. So our question is how to specify the structures related to various kinds of scientific concepts and how to observe their interactions. Previously, many work has been done uh, to answer these questions. So for example, the pattern-based technique allow experts to specify the uh, flow pattern and match those in the flow field. But uh, this kind of technique is difficult to incorporate uh, other structures and understand their relationships. And semantic-based technique often uh, provide an interface to combine multiple criteria to filter the streamlines, but they often come with high learning and usage effort. So our goal is to reduce this kind of effort by using natural language for, uh, for flow visualization customization. Because it is not possible to, in, uh, to embed all kinds of scientific concepts into the system, we would like to provide a way for users to define new concepts through conversation in natural languages and also describe their interactions to be observed in natural languages. Before explaining the techniques, I would like to show you a short demo about what we achieved so far. For example, if the expert wants to see the hurricane, and the system does not understand the concept of hurricane. So uh, it will pop up a dialog box for the expert to explain that the hurricanes are actually uh, spiral flows. And our system will detect the spiral flows and visualize them uh, in a default color because the expert does not uh, specify what kind of color they want. And we can see now all the, uh, all the spiral flows are detected. Uh, similarly, so, uh, the expert can also say that I want to show the typhoon. Again, uh, the system does not understand what is typhoon, so they can explain that typhoon is actually a hurricane in West Pacific region and further explain the West Pacific is a geographic region. And our system will pop up a widget for them to specify the exact location. Now we can see that the uh, uh, typhoon is showing green but it is overlapping with the uh, original orange hurricane. So now the expert can, uh, can say that uh, I want to show the hurricane that's not typhoon in red so that we can distinguish uh, those from the typhoon. And now we can hide the original object of hurricane. Now we see typhoon in green and all other uh, spirals in red. They can also query other kind of structure. For example, they can say that I want to show the uh, vapor transportation to China and explain that vapor transportation is the flow from high R. R is a variable uh, of uh, high, uh, of relative humidity. That's uh, a scalar field in the system. And they can explain what is high R using uh, this kind of graphical widget. And they can also distinguish the vapor transportation from different sources. For example, they can say that I want to see the vapor transportation to China from, uh, from the Mediterranean Sea. And they can also change the color using uh, natural languages. Now we can see uh, this flow becomes green. They can also show the wave transportation from another source for comparison. So for example, they can specify this from Indian Ocean. Because Indian Ocean is already embedded, so it does not uh, require user to specify that. Now let me explain how we achieve this. Because translating natural languages uh, directly into a scientific visualization is actually difficult. We design a declarative grammar as a middle layer. And the translation is done in two steps. So the first step is to pass the nature language and to produce a declarative specification. And the second step is use the specification to guide the generation of visualization. Uh, this is actually a common strategy in nature language interface. But unlike previous work that is mostly done for the abstract data, in this work, we have some special design to uh, describe the flow structures 
and their visualization styles. Uh, the key to describe flow structures in our solution is to derive unknown objects from existing ones. This can be considered as a series of filters in different spaces and their combination. Our solution allows users to uh, specify all their information in a meta file, so, this, uh, so the database becomes like the primitive objects to build all other objects. I will give an example here. So for example, to build the scientific concept of typhoon, the users can uh, specify the typhoon is the spiral near Western Pacific with high wind speed, and our system will pass this nature language and extract the uh, objects involved in this computation. So for example, the flow are the streamlines, and the, uh, the pattern spiral is a region in the latent space uh, from the deep representation, and then their combination will produce spiral flow. And by intersecting the spiral flow with the uh, Western Pacific region and with the high wind speed flow uh, uh, scalar field, we can produce uh, the scientific concept typhoon. To combine the objects and derive the new ones, we design a series of operators, uh, including the standard set operations like union, intersection, and difference. We also design a special neighboring operation for flow. Our neighboring operation extends the flow structure uh, along different direction. For example, N is the uniform neighboring that extends a flow structure bidirectional, and left extends one uh, backward along the flow, and R extends one forward along the flow. So why these operations are useful? I will show you an example here. Uh, for example, the when the expert wants to see the flow from region A to region B, so that flow object can be expressed as the R of A uh, intersecting with L of B. But let's know that the intersection actually can have different meanings. For example, when we are uh, intersecting an object A and an object B, we can mean that we want to take the intersecting segment, the overlapping segment between A and B. And uh, it can also mean that we want to connect A and B. In that case, if A and B are overlapping, then we keep both of them. If A and B are not, then we remove both of them. So we design two different operators for these two uh, purposes. We also design a series of rules to combine objects in different spaces. But due to the time limit, I will uh, refer you to the paper and supplemental materials. So with this uh, operations and rules, the users can recursively specify the unknown objects through dialogues without defining them before the queries. And please also know that uh, we rely on the graphical ridges to resolve the ambiguity. For example, like specifying geographic region or specifying a, a value range, because in this kind of scenarios, we find that a graphical interface is like much easier than like specify several numbers. Using Flow NL, our collaborator can identify the desired structure easily through interaction. For example, here he starts from some uh, kind of noisy background particles and he can gradually uh, identify the structures that are related to the, uh, the forming and disappearing of the, uh, the cloud in atmosphere. Uh, we also have several other cases that are produced by the authors and also by a tutor uh, in science popularization. Uh, so please refer to the paper for those. We also conducted a user study with eight participants of different backgrounds. In general, we find them were willing to explore more by executing a lot of queries after finishing the task, uh, also with a high successful rate. And their rating to the standard SUS questions is 76.6 uh, on average. That's somewhere between good and excellent. Finally, I would like to conclude this talk uh, with a brief discussion. First, we find that language is not always natural for all kinds of tasks, so uh, multimodality interactions is needed. 
And the second thing is that we like to extend the current system in many aspects. For example, like adding other operations such as counting particles and support more complex data such as complex structures and unsteady flow. We also like to uh, experiment with the transformer-based parsers to understand more complex intention. So that's my talk today. Thank you. Well, let's thank uh, Jun. Can you hear me? Ah, uh, yes. Okay. So we're a little tight on time. I have one question. I'll ask you uh, for explaining undefined concepts the way your system does. Did you consider using dictionaries and an external corpora like Wikipedia rather than having the expert type the explanation? Oh, yeah, uh, yeah, uh, that's a great question. We actually considered that before, and we actually built a small dictionary for the uh, atmospherical application. But uh, I guess the issue is that we find that sometimes, sometimes the expert may uh, have different opinion when we, uh, when they are coming from like a different domains. So for example, some, some may consider hurricane to be uh, those kind of spiral flows that's near the Mexico Gulf. And some consider the hurricane that's just the spiral flow uh, everywhere around the world. So we actually find that uh, we also consider that uh, using the knowledge graph as well. So uh, we find that using those kind of automatic approach, some, sometimes it is very difficult to, uh, to fit the specific need of the experts. So and it requires actually a lot of effort uh, from our side to, uh, to, to, to do that. So, uh, but we actually consider that maybe in our future work. So, for example, like we, we can propose, uh, one definition that is most likely and allow the, uh, the expert to select us or, or specify their own, uh, or give their own definition. So, uh, that's what we consider in the, in the, in, in the, in the future. So, uh, basically the short answer is that we do not do that basically due to the uh, the, the vagueness in the uh, natural language. Okay. So far. Yeah. Very good. We're a, we're a little tight on time. There's a there's a, a number of other questions in the Slido, and and perhaps they can be brought over to Discord, and you can connect uh, and answer those online. So let's thank June again for the talk. Thank you, Paul. Uh, our next speaker is Amen Gaba. She's a PhD student at UMass Amherst, and the title of her paper is Comparison Conundrum and the Chamber of Visualizations, an Exploration of How Language Influences Visual Design. Uh, thank you, John, for the introduction. Hi, everyone. My name is Eamon Gaba, uh, and this work is done with, uh, in joint collaboration with my wonderful co-authors, Vidya Settler and Arjun Srinivasan from Tableau, Jane Hausville from Adobe, and my advisor, Cindy Schoen. So to set up some context, natural language interfaces are becoming very popular, both in visualization research and as commercial products. And just to give you all a brief introduction as to what they are, at a high level, given a data set, natural language systems allow people to ask queries in plain language. And the system recommends a visualization that helps answer that query. While these systems have evolved to support a variety of basic statements, such as, show me the user rating of all books written by author A, Sadly, natural language interfaces provide very limited support for comparisons. For example, 
this statement as compare the user rating of looking for Alaska and Gone Girl. And the interesting thing is that comparisons are a very popular class of queries. Previous crowdsourced studies have indicated that people do ask of a lot of comparisons. And they also make comparisons using natural language in different ways. The importance of comparisons and some of the nuances that they present was also emphasized by a wonderful keynote speaker, Dr. Marty Hurst. And some of the reasons as to why these systems lack to provide support for this class of queries is because, number one, the language used while expressing comparisons is nuanced and sometimes also difficult to understand. And number two, there could be several ways of interpreting these comparisons to show appropriate visualization responses. Let's walk through, the, through this example, which is compare the user rating of looking for Alaska in God Girl. Even for something that looks as straight, straightforward as this, there are several plausible responses. The, the system can show a bar chart with two bars comparing the two books with the user rating on the y-axis. Alternatively, the system could also show a unit chart like this one, or maybe a more linear version of a unit chart like this. Or maybe the system can even be smarter and show the price in addition to the user rating for additional context. Now, in addition to selecting the best chart to recommend, the system also needs to consider the challenges of natural language I talked about in the previous slides as to how natural language is nuanced and difficult to interpret. The thing is, these challenges makes the user intent very, di very difficult to parse. For instance, instead of explicitly saying user rating, the user could instead say popularity, which is an ambiguous term in the context of this data set. Given this input, should the word popularity be mapped to user rating, which is in the data set, or the price of the books, or the number of the reviews that the book received. Apart from that, there are other complexities in comparisons as well. We could be comparing one value to another. For example, compare the user rating of looking for Alaska and Gone Girl, in which we are comparing one book to another book. Or we could be comparing multiple values in a set to multiple values in another set, such as compare the books written by JK Rowling to those uh, written by John Green, or we could compare multiple values in a set to mul uh, one value in a set to multiple values in another set, such as compare a high rated book with similar high rated books, or we could be comparing multiple values in the same set. And to read more about them in detail, please read our paper. And so in order to ad address these challenges and better support comparisons, in the context of natural language interfaces, our main research question for this work was, given comparison utterances that vary in language vagueness and the number of items being compared, what visualizations would best represent them? And so with this goal in mind, we conducted two user studies. So for the first study, we created a design space of comparison utterances in natural language varying the level of ambiguity using two different data sets. Next, we conducted about an hour long interviews with data visualization experts and non-experts. We conducted these interviews over Zoom online and showed each participant four comparison utterances varying the level of ambiguity in language. We asked them to recommend um, and sketch visualization or multiple visualizations that would help them make that comparison. We then took the participants' drawing and extracted details for each type of comparison. We extracted details such as the type of the chart, for example, bar chart, dot plot, scatter plot, etc. The orientation, whether it was vertical, horizontal, uh, the arrangement of the bar chart, for example, if it was overlaid, small multiples, the uh, encoding, for example, if the participants suggested that they wanted to change the size of the bubble chart, 
annotations, for example, labeling, axes, interactivity, which means if the participants wanted their visualizations to be interactive in some sort of way. And finally, we also looked at ambiguity as to how the participants interpreted the ambiguous information. Finally, we extracted the top four visualizations for each comparison type and created a more formal version of those visualizations using Vegalite. So all in all, we had 64 visualizations for 16 comparison types. And for example, across all types of one-to-one -one comparisons, these were the top four visualizations that we extracted from the first study. And, or, and in order to cross-validate user preferences for the representative visualization for each comparison type, in our second study, we conducted an online crowdsourced study with about 80 participants recruited via Prolific to complete a survey on Qualtrics. We gave the participants a comparison such as this one, which is compare the user rating of looking for Alaska in Gone Girl, and showed them its top four visualizations uh, such as these. We then asked them to rank the following visualization with regards to how easy a viewer can use them to make that comparison. So our results from this study showed that for all types of one-to-one -one comparisons across all levels of ambiguity, participants preferred the simple vertical bar chart compared to the other three visualizations. For one to n comparisons, where we compare one value to multiple other values in the group, participants preferred the horizontal multi-bar bar chart with that one value highlighted in the bar, in the bar chart, such as shown here. In case of n comparisons, participants preferred the horizontal bar chart as compared to the scatter plot, small multiple bar chart, and box plot. And lastly, for N to M comparisons, participants preferred all three of these visualizations. That is the group bar chart, the, small, uh, the vertical bar chart, and the small multiple horizontal bar chart equally as opposed to the scatter plot. And so some key takeaways from our study. Our preference ranking consistently showed that bar charts, although of various types and arrangements, are preferred for, this, um, for their simplicity for comparisons. Viewers also appreciate to know in the charts how the ambiguous entities are interpreted, and users particularly support interactivity, especially if the comparison language has some ambiguity. So coming back to our first example, where we asked to compare the user rating of looking for Alaska and Gone Girl, you would want your recommendation system to show this as default rather than this. And so we hope that the findings of this study will help in designing future natural language interfaces. To read more about our other findings of our study and the methodology in detail, please read our paper. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you Good so talk. much. Thank you. So one of your questions is the easiest question all week <laughs> asked in Slido, and it's I, answered here, <laughs> which is is the title a reference to Harry Potter. Did people get it? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I, th thank I think you. they did. Um, I also wanted to ask one, to what degree do you think the preferences were kind of the best match or the most familiar, kind of easiest choice, right? Are people, is there a confound a little bit between you know, picking the right one, but obviously if you're not familiar with that graph, it's gonna be difficult for you to pick it as the best choice. Did you, did you all think about that as a, an issue in the experiment? Thank you for the question. Yeah, yeah, it is interesting. So we also asked them as to why they chose mm -hmm. or they prefer the chart that they preferred. And it might be that it was, some, it was more easier for them to understand, but also, the qualitative data that we collected, it also showed that it's just simpler to make that comparison with, as they look at the bar chart as compared to the other charts. But it is interesting to look into what you're saying, and that could be an interesting uh, okay. aspect to look in the future. Okay. Yeah. And the, there are a number of other questions that just came in here right at the end, so I'll, 
uh, again, kind of push those al along to Discord for, okay, the, uh, thank you. for the sake of time. Let's all thank uh, Eamon again. So our next presentation is an online one, and it's by Lenny Yang, who just finished a uh, PhD at Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. And the title is Explaining with Examples, Lessons Learned from Crowdsourced Introductory Description of Information Visualizations. Thank you for coming to this presentation. I will going to present my paper explaining with examples lessons learned from crowdsourced introductory description of information visualization. Assume someone is going to present this visualization in an oral presentation to convey some messages, and it starts with the following introduction. Each row of the chart is allocated to a candidate. Along the y-axis side, you can see the percentage of advertising funding for each candidate. The larger the row, the higher the advertising percentage for that candidate. Along the x-axis, you can see the percentage of advertising spending which targeted each of the four age and gender categories. Do you feel a little bit confusing and not really know what the this is about? Then here is another speaker's introduction. This chart is showing how much presidential candidates decided to spend on advertising, along with who they chose to target the advertising towards. The Y exercise introduces a percentage distribution of advertising among all the candidates. The wider the role of the candidate, the more she or he has spent for advertising comparing to others. Here we can see that Sophia spent the most among all the candidates. Each group of voters is marked by their color. On the X axis, the wider the role of a group is, the bigger percent of advertising was spent to target this group. For example, Jacob has concentrated more than 50% of his advertising on men with the age range of 30 to 44. Now, assume you are a general audience with a short attention span. Which speaker is more likely to make you follow his presentation next? I hope you feel the same way that the second one is better. We have seen more and more data charts in presentations. However, if we fail to introduce its visual encoding clearly, the audience might easily get lost and give up on listening. Yet, this is a challenging task. The two introductions were from the participants in our study. Apparently, the first speaker failed to stand at the point of the audience, giving two abstract explanations and assuming that the audience could understand it as he did. This phenomenon called curse of knowledge has been found in visual communication. An experiment showed that if people are told stories emphasizing on specific regions of a chart, they would assume that others would notice the same regions even if they have not heard the story before. Moreover, it has been found that Expertise affects communication approaches. For instance, one experiment showed that in an electronic circuit writing task, novices who were instructed by beginners surprisingly performed better than the novices who were instructed by experts. Given these two challenges, our study tries to answer this question of how could we generate design guidelines for given effective verbal introductions of visualizations. Our study has two phases. In the first study, we collected a corpus of different introductions and have a design space of these introductions. In the later two studies, we evaluated different introduction strategies to have a set of design implications. How would you introduce this visualization in an oral presentation? We asked this question to 110 participants with varying levels of visualization literacy. We were inspired by the wisdom of crowds and that expertise affects communication approaches. 
and non-expert might come up with better way in communication. We hope this could help us give an inclusive corpus of introductions with different strategies. After that, we break down the introductions from the participants and labeled the content to find out their major components and design strategies. For instance, the two speakers at the beginning both gave explanations of each visual channel at an abstract level. We labeled them as the explanation components. An explanation component selects one visual encoding channels and explains the data variables it represents. Instead of directly going to explaining the visual channels of the chart, the second speaker added a topic sentence at the beginning to provide more contextual information. And we call it the indicator component because it states the goal and summary of the introduction. It typically summarizes the chart topic or indicates that the following introduction is about a chart. Moreover, the second speaker added facts that he found from the chart as examples following each explanation. We labeled these as knowledge components. A knowledge component states the data facts in chart, such as pointing out the trend or reporting specific values. The indicator, explanation, and knowledge components are the major components we found from participants' introductions and were included in our design space of these introductions. You are welcome to see the paper to know about the full design space, which have more subcategories of each major component. Then, in the later two studies, we designed and compared different introduction types to find out the most effective strategies. And we're trying to answer questions like, is the introduction with an indicator component more effective? Is the introduction with a knowledge component more effective? And is there a best sequence to order different components? In the evaluation experiments, we had 30 participants for each chart and type of introductions. Every participant listened to an audio introduction of a chart and then answered some comprehension questions to test whether the introduction helped them understand the chart or not. Here are the major findings of our studies. Introductions with knowledge components are the most effective as participants who listened to this type of introduction performed the best among the others. And then we looked back into the introductions written by participants in study one. For each example they gave, we used a colored rectangle to mark out the corresponding region in the visualization. As shown in the figure, you can find that some regions were more frequently mentioned with more colored rectangles. We did this for all the charts in study one and found that participants preferred to use examples that were easy to be located, such as regions close to the edges of the charts, and examples that were visually salient, such as those that took large areas or were extreme values and outliers. And finally, all the examples were simple to understand and straightforward. We think this could be good strategies for the presenters. Secondly, we believe it's really important for the presenters to get feedback from people with different levels of expertise. For the speakers at the beginning, who do you think is more likely to have a higher visualization literacy score? Well, while the speaker A somehow gave a worse introduction, he actually had a higher visualization literacy score. During our study, we found that participants with higher literacy scores tended to give more explanation components and less knowledge components, although we know that given concrete example can be really helpful. This confirms our initial motivation of inviting participants with different level of expertise and the learning introduction strategies from them. We have more findings and experiments in our paper. We have evaluated different introduction structures 
different approaches to giving an explanation, and we identified several sources of misinterpretations of the chart. You are welcome to read the paper for details, and I like to thank you for listening to this presentation. Now I'm happy to take any question. Let's uh, thank Lenny and. Hi, Lenny. Can you can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Okay. Hi. hi. Good morning, guys. Good morning. So that was really interesting, fascinating. One of the um, kind of themes or ideas we've seen throughout the conference is uh, automatic description or caption generating from some of the machine learning and large language work. In a way, you're getting a more human-centered kind of description of a visualization uh, or something that people might do. Have, have you all, have your group, have you worked on kind of combining uh, automated approaches with some of what, you know, the, the approach that people might follow? Uh, uh, I know that was a complicated have... question. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I, I don't know how to get to the question. Sure. Um, do, do you feel that uh, your findings from your studies could help uh, more automatically kind of explain visualizations to people and what they're about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do believe that. Um, I think it's very important to generating explanation of visualizations for uh, people with diverse expertise in the visualization to understand it. And I think uh, maybe our results can be used to evaluate some generated results, uh, such as if a machine can generate a um, good explanation, it means the generated description should at least tell people the context, or which is like the indicator we found in these introductions, and giving abstract explanations, or even giving more concrete examples. So maybe uh, our results can be used to do some evaluation, uh, and maybe also be used as a um, test or training data set for the uh, machines. And our and we already publi uh, publicized uh, our data set. Uh, you okay. can find it uh, on the paper mm -hmm. and there is a link. Yeah. Okay, very good. There was, we're a little tight on time. There was another question about evaluation and how one, how one might do it, but uh, perhaps you can answer that in the Discord. And, uh, yes, sure, we'll do of it. course. Uh -huh. So thanks again. Thank you for connecting Thank up you. with us. And let's, oh. uh, let's give her a hand again. So our, our, our next presentation is again online. It's by Yun Wang, who's a senior researcher at Microsoft Research Asia. And the title of the paper is Towards Natural Language-Based Visualization Authoring. Hi, this is Yun Wang from Microsoft Research Asia. Today, I'm happy to introduce our work on natural language-based visualization authoring. This is a collaborative work with multiple research students and colleagues, including Zhu Tao, Li Xian, Tong Shuang, Jia Qi, He, Hai Dong, and Dong Mei from Microsoft Research, Tsinghua University, Carnegie Mellon University, and Oxford University. Recently, natural language interfaces are adopted to lower the barrier of using advanced visualization tools. In contrast to WIMP interfaces, these natural language-based systems require less prior knowledge of user interfaces. Users are not restricted to the locations of menus and buttons, and natural language can be served as a complementary input modality to traditional WIMP interaction. While there has been research into natural language interfaces for visualization systems, the systems are primarily designed for data analysis. As shown in this figure, these systems usually parses NL queries into analytic tasks and data attributes. 
They can then be translated into visualization specifications through the implementation of visualization generators or recommenders. These specifications can meet the intended data analysis needs, but they may not meet the requirements of further customization of visualizations or authoring expressive data visualizations, such as changing the underlying data, specifying visual encodings, and adjusting visual presentations like axes, legends, marks, and layouts. On the other side, modern visualization authoring tools have emerged to enable the creation of expressive visualizations. The authoring tools aim to enable people to create and customize their expressive and complex visualizations with simpler user interfaces. When targeting visualizations becomes complex, creating them usually involves more complicated graphical interfaces and interactions. The systems need to provide a wider variety of functions and features and this can result in a steep learning curve. We aim to lower the barrier of supporting NLIs in visualization authoring tools. While the pipeline for analysis-oriented systems usually target analytic tasks, we target more at authoring and editing-related operations. Inspired by existing frameworks, we design a pipeline that decouples natural language understanding and visualization editing execution. At the core of the pipeline is a set of editing actions. These actions are machine executable commands for modeling the visualization editing intents. They bridge the users and visualization applications. The natural language interpreter passes users' utterances into a sequence of editing actions, and the actions are mapped into tool-specific operations. The visualization applications can then adapt and execute the operations to update the visualizations. We make our pipeline realistic by designing two primary building blocks. First, the formalization of the editing actions. The role of editing action in our authoring oriented NLR pipeline is obvious. However, there is still a lack of comprehensive guidance on how to model visualization editing intents. To fill in this gap, we conduct a formative study and literature surveys on visualization construction tools and explicate editing actions as mappings between a series of well-defined editing operations, their target objects, and the corresponding parameters. We implement a natural language interpreter for passing users' own queries into editing actions. It first recognizes data entities and replaces them with abstract arguments. Then, it uses a deep sequence labeling model to extract intents and entities from the abstracted utterances. Finally, it synthesizes the extracted information into a sequence of editing actions. With the deep learning model, we envision that the interpreter can be easily extended to cover a wider range of editing actions as we collect a larger corpus of editing utterances. Both the editing actions and the NL interpreter can be reused across multiple visualization applications. Also, in tool developers only need to build an operation mapper to map the editing action sequences into tool-specific operations. We demonstrate the utility of our design with two example applications, an Excel chart editor and a proof-of-concept authoring tool, VisTalk. We build Excel chart editor an Excel editing to integrate NL-based chart editing into Excel. We provide a natural language input panel for users to type in their natural language commands. Since Excel already offers rich functions of editing charts on the 
Canvas, the primary implementation efforts is on mapping the editing actions to the predefined execution on the charts in Excel. We also develop VSTalk, an NL-based standalone chart creation tool. While Excel add-in concerns augmenting existing tools, we use VSTalk to show how we may design applications to maximize the utility of our NL interpreter. We conduct a user study. We invited 12 participants and asked them to complete chart reconstruction tasks with natural language utterances. We found the participants learned quickly after the training and could complete all the tasks. After the tasks, we asked them to rate their experience of using natural language to create charts, and the participants were all quite positive. For more detailed discussion on the pros and cons of using natural language for visualization authoring, please refer to our paper. To summarize, we explored a natural language-based visualization authoring pipeline and implement an NL interpreter based on our definition of editing actions. We further demonstrated the pipeline with two example applications. This is a first step towards NL-based visualization authoring, and there is still lots of problems to be solved. We'll be happy to discuss with you and conduct further exploration on this topic. Thank you. It's, uh, thank you. Hi, Yun. Can you hear me? Hi, John. Yeah. Yeah. It's good to see you this morning. So uh, I have some questions in Slido. The first one is, are there clear differences in how people state their natural language input in an authoring or analytics context, which could be used to forward this input to the correct pipeline in future systems that implement both? I think um, from, from our study, um, there's no such differences between um I, I think the the difference comes from um, different emphasis for analytic systems they also support some editing or authoring intents and for authoring systems they also um support analytic intents and um i think so the 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 problem of supporting different um, intents is that we can um, um, think of how we can combine those two different pipelines together and um, to um, support more about how uh, about dif um, different um, different uh, usages and um, the different purpose of applications. Okay. Also, th there's another one that talks a little bit about, uh, let me generalize, kind of their, a person's design experience, just broadly mm -hmm. in general. And how, mm -hmm. how did you feel that impacted then what they were able to do with natural language? I think this is quite important in our um, study, in, in the um, preliminary study, we find that um, people with different visualization literacy will have different patterns, show, show different patterns when they describe their authoring intents. For example, people with less visualization knowledge, they may use some higher level uh, natural language to describe and they expect the system can interpret their um, their their, their uh, commands correctly and uh, um, do more things to um, automatically to to complete their their commands. And for people with more visualization expertise or experience, they will um, describe very precisely about what they want. 
And I think um, this is also the challenge of developing such kinds of um, natural language based systems. And I think we need more data and experience and more research to um, serve better um, for a different audience and different users. Okay, very good. Well, thank you again, Ian. Let's uh, give a hand again to you. And for our, uh, our, our last speaker of the session is Chase Stokes. Chase is a PhD student at Berkeley. And the title of his paper is Striking a Balance, Reader Takeaways and Preferences When Integrating Text and Charts. First of all, I want to thank you all for sticking around on, on Friday morning. I know that we are a little short on time, so I'm going to try to make this an efficient use of your time as well, if I can um, figure out an HDMI cable. Thank you so much. Great, so uh, my name is Chase Stokes. I'm a second year PhD student at the University of California, Berkeley. There I'm advised by Marty Hurst and together with three brilliant collaborators, Vidya Settler, Bridget Kogli, and Arvind Satyanarayan, we examined reader takeaways and preferences for integrating text and charts. So the start of this project centered around a dial that ranged from a visual side of communication to a textual side. And there are many different locations on this dial where one can select to present their information but we are most interested in this integration of text and charts, this addition of text to a visualization. In particular, whether or not readers had preferences for one side or another, and how the text that you added to a visualization affected how the reader thought about the data. So we answered these three wordy research questions, but since it's Friday, I made them a little bit shorter, and uh, we looked at how much text should we add, what should it say, and where should it go? So to give you a little background on what we know about this dial, um, we know that adding a caption to a visualization, particularly a univariate line chart, can help to guide the participant's takeaway, um, but it does not enforce the text. So adding text makes it more likely that they'll mention the feature mentioned in the text in their takeaway, but the visual components of the visualization are still the primary driver of this takeaway. We also know that titles are very visually salient. They draw the eye effectively and early on in one's interaction with a visualization. And we also know that in interactions with a chatbot, 40% of participants didn't want to see a visualization whatsoever. So with these uh, background in mind, we completed an experiment with four main sections. 302 participants from Amazon's Mechanical Turk uh, completed this, and this is all registered on Open Science Framework prior to data collection. For the purposes of time, I'm only going to speak about the preference ranking and enter takeaways sections, but I encourage you to read the paper for a more holistic view. So in the preference ranking section, participants viewed two sets of, of information depicting the same information, but visualized differently. So if we think about this in relation to the dial I talked about earlier, we have one set which it represents the extremes of this dial, ranging from a chart only to a text only representation of information. And we have another set which is a more fine grained comparison, ranging from one to three pieces of text. Participants were asked to rate this information, or rank this information rather, um, in order of their preference. We found that the charts with the least amount of text were ranked last. The text only variant was ranked third. The chart with the sort of middle amount of text, a, a title and a single annotation, was ranked second overall. And the chart with the most amount of text was ranked first. So we found that this replicated from the extremes to the fine grained comparisons as well. So overall, we get this result that sort of pushes us towards the middle of this dial, indicating that readers like to see uh, text with visualizations. And so rather than aim for a minimalist design guideline, annotate your charts with relevant text. It's what readers want to see. And returning to these results, we are also interested in the role or responses to this all text variant. In particular, the distributions of rankings overall uh, among participants. We found that an astonishing 14% of participants actually wanted to see this all text variant over any form of visual representation. 
And furthermore, 40% of participants ranked it in the top two, indicating that there was a strong preference for visual or for textual communication over most forms of visual communication. So not only should we annotate our charts with relevant text, we should also consider a text-only variant that can stand alone. Not only is this a useful uh, item in terms of accessibility standards for alternative text for images and visualizations, but it turns out that readers also, a substantial minority of them at least, want to see it. If you're interested more about these preferences, uh, we have a paper at the NLVIS workshop earlier this week that I encourage you to read. So moving on to the enter, oops, sorry, moving on to the enter takeaways section, uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we made these stimuli uh, to tell you more about how we analyzed them. So we used univariate line charts generated as, with the same method as in Kim, Sether, and Agarwala, and we used Lungard and Satyana Ryan's four-level model of semantic content. And this model, L1, represents encoded and elemental language. So for instance, here, number of app users range from zero to 500K is telling us what's being represented in the element, the y-axis. L2 is statistical and relational information. So here, number of app users in 2020, less than 2015. It's taking two points and stating their relation. One is less than the other. L3 is more cognitive and perceptual in nature. Here, rapid increase in users from 2012 to 2013. That rapid increase component is giving us some perceptual information within the language itself. And finally, L4 is contextual and domain-specific information. So in this case, update to the app introduced large issues for users is telling us about an external event uh, that might inform our understanding of the visualization. So we wrote uh, these four annotations for all of the charts that we generated, and we also carefully counterbalanced the positions. That was an interesting question to us, right? Where do we put the text? So in this case, you see L1 in its axis position. L1 was sort of a unique, uh, unique situation because it didn't refer to any particular data component. Um, so it has a separate set of positions. So this one being the axis position in that it describes what the axis is showing, and it's positioned near the, relatively near the x-axis. It could also be a title or what we called a line. So in this, it's depicting how the data is being encoded, and it was in this floating gray box that was positioned near the line itself. L2, L3, and L4 all had the same set of positions. So here you see statistical and relational information, our L2 text in the title. Our perceptual or L3 text is in a line position. This is often accompanied by either a gray arrow or a sort of gray band indicating what a region it referred to. And you see our L4 contextual information is positioned as a point. This was always accompanied with that blue dot you see. So participants viewed a chart with one or two pieces of text, and then on a separate page entered anywhere from one to three takeaways. So here, uh, we coded these takeaways for uh, the semantic level of the takeaway, so what the, how the, what the participant said matched onto our concept of language, and then whether or not it matched the text that we provided explicitly. In this first takeaway, which reads rapid increase in app users from 2012 to 2013, this takeaway was coded as L3 due to that rapid increase terminology. And it looks very familiar. It matches almost exactly the text that we provided. So this was coded as a match. The second takeaway, overall trend is a decrease in app users, was also coded as L3. Um, it's stating something cognitive or perceptual about the, the text or about the chart in the text overall trend. Um, but it did not match the text that we provided, so it was not coded as such. I'm going to visualize these results in something akin to a correlation matrix. So on the rows here, we have the, the level of text we provided to the participant, and in the columns, we have the level of text the participant provided back to us. For example, in our original uh, example, we had the on-chart text being uh, level three, this perceptual information, as was the participant takeaway, and so that takeaway would be counted in this box. We would expect to see a strong presence on the diagonal, that is, a strong correlation between the text that we provided and the text that the participant provided back to us. These are the results, and we do see a presence along this diagonal. It is strongest for L2 and L4, so seeing some kind of statistical or relational information could make participants about twice as likely to use statistical and relational information in their takeaway. And likewise, seeing external context in a visualization made readers almost five, or about five times as likely um, to represent that information in their, their takeaway as well. Now, we don't see the same effect for L1 and L3. So it was really rare that participants would even make takeaways about encoded information. That wasn't something that was really like a conclusion level uh, item. So only 48 takeaways were coded as such. That's only 7% of our overall set. Whereas for L3, this was very common. So 61% of our takeaways were coded as L3, uh, indicating that cognitive perceptual conclusions are very common. So I wish we had some kind of easy statement of put this in your text and you're good to go, uh, but it's not quite that simple. 
rather use the intended takeaway to construct the text content. So for instance, if my intended takeaway is relational in nature, I should use L2 text to help the participant think about the chart in that way. Now we are also interested in the position of the text. So here on the rows, we have the position that we put the text in. For simplicity purposes, I've combined point and axis, but they were very similar uh, in content. And on the, the columns, we have the level of the participant's takeaway as well. Uh, I want to specify this is only for the takeaways which match the text we provided. So it's a subset of the, the full set of takeaways. If we take our original example, the text in the chart is positioned as a line with that gray arrow, and the text level of the participant's takeaway is L3, so this takeaway is counted in this square here. We expected to see a strong effect of the title. We know that titles are salient, and we consider them sort of an orienting space to the visualization. So we thought every, or every level would be most likely to be matched if it were positioned as a title. And these are the results, and you can see that's not really what we found. So for L1, L2, and L4, it was actually more likely that the participant would match the text we provided if the text were positioned closer to the data in the form of a point or a line. But for L3, our perceptual or cognitive information, it was most likely to, likely to be matched as a title, possibly because it's providing some kind of overview to the chart itself. So in addition to using your intended takeaway to construct your content, Use that content to inform how you position the text in the chart to make it more effective or more likely to be matched by the reader in their conclusion. So overall, we've learned a lot more about this dial in even just this small subset of univariate line charts. We know that readers want to see text integrated with the chart. We know that actually a substantial minority want to see that text alone. We know that text content has subtle influences on the takeaways. And where you put the text, the text position, can make the reader more or less likely to incorporate that text explicitly into their information. I want to thank you so much for your attention. Feel free to contact me with any questions, and we have all the materials and pre-registration available at this QR code. Thank you. Let's thank Chase. There's some very good questions. Let me ask a couple of them sure. kind of going forward. First one I know is a bit difficult, but asking you to speculate. How do you think it would generalize to other types of charts, maybe interactive dashboards, things like that? Yeah, I think that's really interesting. I think interactive dashboards in particular is an interesting question because um, there the position of the text can be so close to the data because you're not worried about obscuring other data like you are with a static image. And in particular, we wanted to use univariate line charts because it has a lot of blank space to fill with text, whereas other charts like bar charts uh, or scatter plots might not have that same blank space. So um, I would be interested to, to explore that space and to see whether or not the positioning of the, the text being more difficult actually makes the text better positioned in other locations. Mm -hmm. So Good. very interesting question. Yeah. I'm happy to talk about that further. The, the second one's maybe a great question for all the authors and even everyone in the room who does it. Philosophically, text is just a viz. It's a symbolic <laughs> representation of inference. So what's the big deal? Why are you, you know, what's the... Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think the big deal is because it's not seen as, as viz. And so yeah. that was the whole point that... that yeah. um, uh, Marty Hurst uh, was making in the keynote is we're not thinking of text as co-equal to visualization fundamentally in our research. And so I think as we start to think about it in that way, we realize that it is. It is fundamentally just another representation of information, equally as important and equally as communicative as some kinds of visualization. So it's a really interesting question that I encourage us all to think more about. Yeah, it's really well put. Let's thank Chase again. Thank you all for thank coming so much. to this session. These good papers, really good. <laughs>